All right. Well, good morning. It's so good to be here with you today. And we're uh, starting just a few seconds early here. Go ahead and let y'all start popping on and joining uh, with us as uh, we come together here today. It's, all right. We got some of them start coming on. Hey, Becky and Jessica, uh, Buddy and all y'all, Miss Kathy. And we'll, we'll welcome Jacob too. Hey, it's good to see everybody this morning. Uh, Y'all are starting to come on uh, here uh, this morning. Well, uh, we've got a, a good service plan today. Uh, and uh, we were just praying here in the office uh, this morning, uh, following God's leadership and knowing that whatever plans we've got, that God has an even greater plan for our time together here today, uh, this morning. Amen. And uh, so we do want you all to remember to start uh, welcoming down there in the comment section. Tell somebody hi that you're glad to see them this morning. Uh, we're going to open up in a word of prayer as y'all start doing that. And uh, then we're going to pass things off to Brother Waylon and Brother Brian here with us this morning to lead us in worship. Uh, and uh, I hope your heart's prepared. And, and if not, uh, let's, let's, let's get prepared through these songs and through this time of prayer, all right? Uh, Brother Brian, could I ask you to open our service this morning? Dearly Father, Lord, again, we thank you for this opportunity to, to worship you this morning. And Lord, I just pray that uh, your will be done in this service, that you would just if, not let us be any kind of hindrance to your will. And Lord, I just pray that you speak through Brother Tony and... Uh, Give us a good time of worship here in a few moments, and I ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to start off this morning by singing Blessed Assurance. Sing along with us. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my Savior This is 
my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. song is going to be open our eyes lord and we want this to be our prayer today that he'll open our eyes and ears to hear what his message is today
we thank you for this time. Lord, I do pray that you would just open up our hearts and our minds and our souls to hear your message today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, it is so good to get to worship with y'all this morning. And I uh, hope those songs encouraged your hearts as much as they did mine. Because if they did, we've already had a great time encountering uh, the Spirit of the Living God here today. Amen? Amen. And I invite you to open your Bible with me today uh, to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And we're going to look down, uh, begin at verse 27. Mark chapter 8, down at verse 27. And we're going to uh, walk through the remainder of the chapter uh, there in our time together today. Mark chapter 8. Verse 27, I look at a passage like this and I was reminded about the mission that Coca-Cola had some years ago. They had a, a mission that they were going to take their uh, precious liquid uh, from their perspective to the whole world. They had a strategy. In fact, one, it was uh, popularly said that one of their uh, CEOs, their executives, his strategy was that he wanted to put a vending machine in every village around the globe to make sure that everyone around the world got to taste and experience uh, the, the refreshing uh, liquid that they had. I, I, I think about that and I look at a passage here and I'm reminded that as, now myself, I'm a Dr. Pepper fan, but we'll leave that aside. Uh, we have a life-giving, refreshing liquid that we need to let the world know about. We've got a message to tell, and we've got a mission to accomplish given to us by King Jesus. Today, I want to talk to you about the steps we need to take to do our part to ensure that everyone in our world hears the message of Jesus and his life-giving and sin-cleansing liquid so that they can know the hope and the peace that you, as a believer, have found. And listen, if you're listening today and you've not placed your faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross, here's what God wants to do in your heart and your life today. Just going to let you know on the front end, God wants you to trust in Jesus so that you can have the assuring hope of a life that has been changed forever through the forgiveness of sin by, plus, by placing your faith and your trust in Jesus. And that's what Jesus starts out here with his disciples. It's a familiar scene as he takes his disciples aside and he begins to ask them some questions about who the world says he is. But there's a question in here every one of us has to answer. But who do you, who do you say that Jesus is? And for us to answer that, I, I, I want to, and for us to accomplish the mission that he's given to us as believers, there's a few principles here in God's word that I want to share with you. But pick up with me. And Jesus went uh, with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. Change of location here. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You're the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell him. And uh, I can see that we're having a little bit of intermittent technical difficulties. Y'all just hang with us. And... Uh, we're, God's going to bless this anyway. I think the devil's trying awful hard here to, this morning to keep God's message from going out, all right? But here's the first thing that we need to do. As we, as we look at this passage, and as a believer, we think about the mission that Jesus has for us to accomplish, and we think even those of us who are uh, God is dealing with maybe even this morning, Here's the thing that God wants us to know. If we are to accomplish the mission that God has for our life, to tell others about him so that they have the hope that he ha wants us to have of the assurance of the forgiveness of sin, the first thing that we have to do is we have to ask God to open our eyes, to open our eyes and to let him see what he sees. 
That's what Jesus is doing here when he pulls his disciples aside. He takes them apart uh, from where they have been. They're on mission, following Jesus, learning. And Jesus knows that uh, for most of us, the best way that we learn is that we learn best by seeing it in the moment. And so Jesus takes his disciples out here to Caesarea Philippi. And he had, they've had kind of a big conference, and now he pulls them a, a, away into one of the breakout sessions, and he's asking them some questions about what they have found out and they've experienced out there in the world, seeing what the world thinks about Jesus. And it's in these first verses that we see that Jesus makes what we call the great confession of faith. When Jesus asked uh, them who the world said that, said that Jesus was, Jesus gave, they gave Jesus some different responses. But then Jesus drilled down and he said, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And, G and Peter tells Jesus, well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Matthew, in his gospel, in Matthew 16, he gives us a little more commentary on this situation, on the scene here. Gives us a little more detail about what happened. And he tells us Jesus' response here a little more precisely. And there we see that Jesus told Simon, And blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my kingdom, my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Hey, that's good news right there. No matter how hard the devil tries, we win. Those who have trusted in Jesus, we win because of what he's done for us. Amen. And I, I, I could see, yeah, there we go. There's, I, I think if we were in the, in the worship center, we'd all be amening and hallelujah. Uh, I just invented a word this morning. <laughs> Praising God for that good news. But here's the deal. Some folks have the idea, just need to explain this, that some folks have the idea that in this moment that Jesus has just told Peter that he's the rock and that Jesus is going to build his church, his kingdom on Peter. Well, if you know anything about Peter you know that he wasn't exactly a rock to build the foundation on. In fact, in you're going to see that in just a, the, a few moments here in the following scene, in the following verses that we read. J Peter goes from being, from being praised by Jesus, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, to get behind me, Satan. So he's, he's no uh, rock to build on. Well, there, there was one time, though, that he walked with Jesus out on the water, and uh, did some miraculous things through his faith and his trust in Jesus. But then, I, you know, uh, Brother Whalen, I think he might have been the first ever to buy stock in Chevrolet because then we see in that scene how he sank like a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive, I, I'll take some pity laughter out there this morning. I appreciate all of your love and support here today, okay? But he makes a confession of faith. That really encapsulizes what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus he, he says that you're the Christ. That is, you're the Savior that God had promised. And it's not Peter that he was going to build his church on, but it was that simple confession that Jesus is the Savior. That's what Jesus builds his church on. That when we place our faith in Jesus, telling God that, he, that we believe that Jesus is who he said he is, that we believe we are who God says we are, that we're sinners, that we do wrong, and we believe that Jesus is the only solution for our sin, that's how we get saved. And that's all that it takes for, it, for anybody to be saved. Now, I know what you're saying as you watch this, you say, well, that sounds awfully simple. Well, I believe it's simple on purpose. Sim so simple even. So simple that a child can understand the gospel, the basics of the, gosp the gospel message, and give all of their heart and all of their faith to Jesus. But you know the world has a problem 
with the simplicity of the gospel. Because the world wants to earn salvation. If you told the world that there was a way for them to earn the, their salvation, that God's forgiveness, and be made right with him, they would work themselves to death trying to do it. But the thing is, is that our works will never open the door of salvation, and only faith and trust in Jesus will do it. Because God has set up salvation by, by faith in Jesus Christ alone. You may ask, why faith and why not works? I mean, I try to be a good person. Well, you know why it's faith and not by works? Because faith takes humility. Humility before God to answer, and to answer honestly. To say, God, no matter how good I may think that I am, comparing myself to others, the truth is, God, I could never measure up, and I need you to forgive me. And I believe that Jesus did for me what I could never do for myself when he died on the cross to pay for my wrongs and to humble our hearts. And friends, when we do that, God will save us and forgive us and you can know his peace in your heart from that day forward. But I look at this passage that we look at here in verses 27 through 30 and it just made me ask, why? Why did Jesus take his disciples out here to Caesarea Philippi? It's not like they were short of places to pull over alongside the road. They could have stopped there in Jerusalem. There's pretty good places there. They could have gone back to that Mount of Olives where Jesus so often took his disciples. Why is it that he took them here to Caesarea Philippi? Here's what I believe Jesus was doing. Jesus took those disciples there to Caesarea Philippi to take them out of their comfort zone so that they could see just how lost the world is and so that he could open their eyes to the mission field that was right in their backyard. This place, Caesarea Philippi, it's on the edge of Israel, uh, Phoenicia, where the and Syria. It's on the edge of the Gentile nations. It's as far out uh, in, the, in the backwoods of Israel as you could get without being in Gentile country. It's where lost folks lived. Those who didn't know the message of Jesus. And that's what they found out there, wasn't it? When they went out, Jesus sent them out to investigate. And they come back and they bring report about all the confusion out in the world about who Jesus is and what he had come to do. That's the responses that they hear uh, Jesus asked him, and some thought that he was John the Baptist. Some thought that he was Elijah or one of the prophets. Matt, uh, one of the other Gospels, I believe it's Matthew, tells us that some thought that he was Jeremiah, was one of the prophets who was brokenhearted over the sin of Israel, and he wept over their sin just as Jesus did, as he was brokenhearted for the sins of people. And they found that the world was lost all the way back then. But can I just tell you that the world is still as lost today as it's ever been. There's a lot of different ideas about who Jesus is out there in the world. Uh, just let me give you some examples, some that you're probably familiar with. If you ask most people out there who they think that Jesus is, things that you're going to hear is you're going to hear that they believed that Jesus was a good moral example to follow. Something along those lines, that, he, that he's a good man that showed us a, a better way to live. And that's partly true. He sure, sure did. He, so, he showed us the best way to live, but mostly through our faith in him. Some say that he was a good moral example. Some say that he was a prophet like, like others. Certain religions all around the world don't deny that Jesus was a messenger from God. But he's, while he's that, he's far more than that. He was the Son of God sent to save sinners through our faith and our trust in him. That's why he had come. And that's even what Jesus summarized the, his mission was all about as he told Zacchaeus. You remember the story of wee little Zacchaeus up in a tree? Jesus saw him and he told him to come down to where he was. And he said, Zacchaeus, the son of man, has come to, say, to seek and to save 
that which was lost. And believer, I just got to tell you this, this morning, church, as I prayed through this all this week, God burdened my heart that if that's Jesus' mission, if that's Jesus' mission, that ought to be our life mission. The very sad and very true and tragic story is told of a little girl from Arlington, Texas in 1996 who was, a, who was abducted. She was with her brother riding her bike and a neighbor saw the whole event take place and when she saw uh, her get abducted she immediately called the police and her little brother went home to go inform her parents about what had happened. And the tragic thing is is that even as the, they concerted their efforts through the media and the FBI and even local search parties began to look for this little girl. Tragically, two days later, they found her body deceased in a creek. It was a sudden and serious situation. Here's what, and, and her life's story and her testimony of her life developed what we now call the Amber Alert System. Her name was Amber Hagerman. And I think about that story and I'm reminded that as real and serious as that situation is and we cannot even begin to imagine what that family must have gone through. As real and serious as that situation is, God has children all over the world who have been abducted and taken captive by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And he has given his church as an embassy to reach out to them with the saving message of Jesus so that they could be rescued from sin. And if we are to accomplish the mission that Jesus has given to us, we have, we have to come to God humbly asking God to open our eyes to help him to see lost people the way that he sees them with brokenness, with hurt for them, with compassion for them, and be motivated to take the simple message of the gospel, the message that you've believed, and take it to them so that they can be saved. We've got to ask God to open our eyes. But not only that, if we're going to accomplish the mission that Jesus has given to us, we've got to ask God to give us a, an open heart to live in his will for our life, to give us an open heart to follow his will for our life. Look at verses 31 through 34. And he began to teach them, that is the disciples, this is the same event. After Peter makes this great confession, he began to teach them that the Son of Man, that is Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priest and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And we all would say amen because we know that that is something that has happened. Amen. Look at verse 32. And he said this plainly. <laughs> and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Have you ever argued with God about his will for your life? Well, that's Peter. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You got to feel bad for Peter. He's the only one bold enough to speak up for the group, and then he gets chastised because he's the group spokesperson. But look down at verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, and he's speaking to his disciples there as well, he said to them, verse 34, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, you got to feel bad for Peter. He's, he, he's gone from being up on the mountaintop as close as, in fellowship as you could get with Jesus. Jesus has just given him a good old boy pat on the back there before the other disciples. He's feeling pretty good about himself. And then Jesus begins to tell him what God's will is for Jesus' life, that Jesus was fully committed to surrendering and submitting his life to the will of the Father, even though he was going to die on the cross 
for us. Not for things he had done, but for things you and I have done, the wrongs that we do before God that separate us from God outside of our faith and our trust in Jesus. And Jesus made it real plain to him. He wasn't talking in parables. He wasn't using illustrations. He just told them, these are the facts, guys. I'm going to be betrayed. They're going to put me on trial. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. And then I'm going to raise again. And somehow or another, the disciples didn't understand the message. They had a hard time accepting it. They didn't get it. In fact, uh, in the following chapters, in chapters 9 and verses in chapters 10, we're going to see the disciples and how they wrestle with this. And Jesus tells them over and over again from this point forward, he's drilling home what he had come to do for anybody who placed their faith in that he was going to the cross. In Mark chapter 9, he tells the disciples again what he was going to do, that he was going to be crucified for our forgiveness. But you know what their response was? I just can't get over this, Brother Brian. Their response was that they, after the conference was over and after worship, and after Jesus told them he was going to die, you know what they began to do? They began to bicker and argue among themselves about who was going to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. Which one of them was going to get the, the, the prized uh, position on Jesus' cabinet? <laughs> well, you, it gets worse. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus again told the disciples what he was going to do, that he was going to die for the sins of the world. And do you remember how the disciples responded there? In Mark chapter 10, James and John, sons of thunder, because they had a big mouth, okay? <laughs> sons of thunder. They come along and they pull Jesus aside and they say, Hey Jesus, we want you to do us a favor. We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. You know, I read that passage and I'm reminded of some, some time in the near future where I can admit, imagine my oldest boy, Asher, saying, Dad, I want you to do something for me, but before I ask you, I want you to promise me that you'll say yes. <laughs> how many of y'all know that that's not how prayer works? Amen? One would be at his right and one of them would be at his left seated in the seats of prominence and the seats of authority. Well, aren't you glad that for unanswered prayer because had Jesus said yes to that, one of them would have been hung on a cross to the right and the other would have been hung on a cross to the left because that's how Jesus came into his kingdom. He wasn't going to be an earthly king, but a spiritual king who rules on our hearts through our faith in him. But you read this story and it doesn't look like the disciples are going the same direction as Jesus. Jesus is going to the cross and they're going after their own kingdoms. Can I tell you how they missed it? Why they missed it and why they were having such a hard time understanding it? Because they lived in the same kind of world that we do. When the chips were down, if the truth be told, they were concerned about their own mission instead of the mission of Jesus. And I have a hard time being convinced that we don't do the same thing today, even as believers in Jesus. Christians who have walked with Jesus for many years, we have a hard time putting down our agenda and living for the king's agenda. Because we live in a world that tells us we're flooded by messages like, try our product, you deserve it. Have you ever heard of commercials like that? That's the tagline behind it, you deserve it. And you'll never forget the Burger King advertisement, how Burger King says, have it your way. The world tells us that Life is all about us and what we want, what we desire, our preferences, our comforts, our desires. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, that our life is really found in glorifying God. That in all we do, whether we eat or drink, the most commonplace things out there, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And that's what Jesus is asking us to do. God uh, gave me an illustration this morning. These apples here in this platter represent our life. And what God's asking us to do is to give all of our life to him, all that we are, every, everything that we're involved in, everything that we think on, everything we do, all that we are, give it to him. And listen, he's going to bless us, and we're going to reap uh, the benefit and the blessing of walking with him. But you know what most of us do? Instead of giving him all of our life, we pick up a part of our life. And we say, 
God, I'll give this part of my life to you. But then we say, but you know, God, I got to work. Well, God, you know, I got I got to I got to go to that PTA meeting. God, you know what else I got to do? Work was hard. I got to watch some TV and recreate. I got to spend some time on Facebook. Next thing you know, we're saying, here you go, God. You can have all of this. Here's my sacrifice. Here's my sacrifice for you. For you. But if we want to walk in all of God's blessings, considering all that Jesus gave for us. The least we could do is give him all of ourselves back to him. So we got to ask him to give us an open heart that follows his will for our lives. Here's the last thing that we got to do. We got to ask God to help us be bold enough to open our mouths. Got to ask God to help us be open, uh, bold enough to open our mouths. Look at the next few verses there in verse 35 through 38. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever, verse 38, is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the, the holy angels. We've got to ask God to give us open eyes, give us an open heart, and then we have to ask God to give us the boldness to overcome our timidness, and to help us to open our mouth to tell about what Jesus has done in our life. If we're going to accomplish, accomplish that mission. Well, you say, Pastor, why should, we, why should we tell others about what Jesus has done for our lives? Number one, because we know about the emptiness of the world. Jesus tells us in verse 35 and 37, he asked one of those rhetorical questions. Ask the question that your mom asked you when you got in trouble and you knew you weren't supposed to answer, but you might have answered anyway, and then you paid for it, okay? It, it, it's a question that the, the answer is obvious to. Okay? And what Jesus is doing here in verses 35 through 30, 37 is he's simply reminding believers about the emptiness of the world. Listen, this is the, the, even if you could trade your whole self, the, 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 the principle here is that you couldn't gain the whole world. And even if you could gain the whole world, you'd still be miserable. And he wants us to be reminded of the emptiness of the promises that the world makes so that we can help those in our lives, in our sphere of influence, our friends, our family, those in our own neighborhood, maybe God would have us start a mission field right there in our neighborhood to help them to see how empty the world is, but how Jesus gives us an abundant life through trusting in his promises and his word, and ultimately how that abundant life will pour over into eternal life through faith in him. You know, I think about this, and I was reminded about a time that me and Sarah we went up to uh, Branson, Missouri, and uh, we took a little sidetrack, ended up around Joplin for some reason, uh, just taking a little road trip. And we got up there to Joplin, Missouri, which is part of Route 66, and we thought there's got to be some car museum or something to go see uh, when you get up there. So we went down to City Hall, and we got one of those pamphlets uh, out there uh, for some of the things to do. And Sarah, you got to know that she is big into art. Now, I can hardly make a stick man stand up straight. But Sarah, she, she, she's blessed and gifted in that. And so we wanted to go see this big art museum that was publicized and advertised there by, the, by City Hall in their brochure. Okay? So we put in the directions into our GPS. We hunt and track all over town. And we pull up and we thought, we can't be at the right place. We can't be. 
And we walk up to the doors and we look in the window and do you know where we were taken? It was the right place. We, we could look through the window and there were two little pictures in a dental office. <laughs> in a dental office that we that they had advertised and they had publicized and they had told us that we would have a great time going to. And I think about that and I think that that is oftentimes what, exactly what the world does. It publicizes, it announces, it advertises how good and how fulfilling it's going to be when you get there only to find out what a sham, what a phony, what a fake and how empty it is. So we got to open our mouths to tell people about the emptiness of the world and the fulfillment that we find in our redeemed relationship with Jesus. But not only should we open our mouth and tell people about the saving message of Jesus because of how empty the world is, but listen, you got to think about how extravagant, how extravagant God's gift of love was. Jesus tells us there in verse 38, read again, he said, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Now some people take this to mean that salvation is somehow conditional. That if I don't share my faith that somehow I'm going to lose my salvation. But that's not Jesus' point at all here. What Jesus' point is, is that anyone who, who truly does understand and appreciate and believes what Jesus did for them, sacrificing his all, laying down his life for us, that we couldn't help but tell others. And we grow in that by increments. But I'll tell you what happened to me the day I got saved. When I, was, when I was nine years old in third grade, I'd been picked up by a bus ministry. And I got off that bus, and I, I had walked an aisle and talked to a pastor, and they passed me off to a youth pastor probably, or one of their deacons, somebody in their church to counsel me. But my life was changed that day that I met Jesus. And I got off that bus, and listen, nobody had to tell me. I didn't go uh, uh, to, to, to uh, share your faith class. I didn't, I didn't have any of that. I was just excited about what Jesus did. And I, listen, fat boy ran all the way home two blocks to tell my mom and dad about it. Nobody had to coach me into it. I just told them the simple story about what had happened to me. Because that's what happens in the life of the believer. You get... You just become overwhelmed with the love of God when you realize what he did, what he did for you. The story is told of a man who bought a very expensive diamond ring for, for his soon-to-be bride. He was a little nervous, though, about proposing to her, and so he goes down to, to the jewelry store, and he gets it, and it's in one of those really nice, fuzzy bo black boxes, y'all know. And he, he worked for weeks over time to be able to buy the most expensive ring they had. Big old diamond. And they put it in there when he was finally got through making payments on it and he was ready to go tell, it, tell his girl about it. But he couldn't work up the nerve to tell her that day. And he thought, well, I tell you what, I'll just give this to her and then I'll tell her uh, what, that she could take a look at it and surely she'll figure out what, what I've asked her, what I'm asking her. So they go on a date, and he, before they go home, he gives her the ring. And he says, you don't have to say anything right now. I just, just come back in, in a few days, next time we see each other, and, and you can tell me. Well, she comes back the next time they come together. And he asked, well, uh, what'd you think? And she pulled out that little black fuzzy box, and she said, man, this thing's great. It, I, I've never seen velvet uh, feel so like this or be so smooth, so nice. And he said, yeah, that box is nice, but what about the ring inside of it, that big diamond? And she said, oh, you mean that piece of glass with wire wrapped around it? Oh, I threw that away. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? And that's the point. Had she known and had she truly appreciated the great sacrifice that had been made for her, she couldn't have helped 
but to boast to all her friends about the love that had been bestowed on her. And friends, that's all God's asking you to do as a believer in Jesus, to remember the day that you got saved and tell your simple testimony of how you got saved. But you know, maybe you're watching today and I, I, just, I just imagine that with the number of folks that see this today or throughout the week that somebody out there is going to see this and they would say, you know what, I, I don't have a saving relationship with Jesus. You talk about all these things called sin and, and what Jesus did on the cross and I, I've heard about that. I've grown up here. I, I, I'm familiar with those terms, but, but the truth be told, I've never trusted in Jesus. Here's what God's asking you to do today. All it takes to be saved is to simply admit that you do wrong before God. And the Bible calls that sin. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the bad, bad news is, is the, the wages for our wrong is death and eternal separation from God. But the good news is, and Romans 6.23 tells us that the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And by placing our faith in Him. Well, how do you do that? How do you place your faith in Him? You confess. Romans 10.13 says, All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And God wants you to call on Him today and be saved. You can do that by saying, From your heart. These words aren't magical, but from your heart and in your own words, tell him, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've done wrong. I believe that Jesus died for me and is risen again. God, forgive me and make Jesus the new boss of my heart and my life right now. Friend, if that's you, if you've prayed that prayer and from your heart to God, God's heard it. And we would like to, we would like to be able to follow up with you here in just a moment, you're going to see a, a link in the comments It'll give you an avenue to respond so that we could follow up with you, give you some resources for a new walk with Jesus. Or you can email me at pastor at Highland Park, uh, pastor at hpbcmp.com. You can click the link there or again email at pastor at hpbcmp.com. If you have a prayer request, you can also uh, click that link and send it there. But you say, Pastor, I, for me, I'm a believer. I've known Jesus for a long time. I know where I'm going, and praise God for that. But could I just ask you today, could I just ask you, are you on Jesus' mission? Are you living on mission for Jesus? Maybe today you need to do just what we talked about and ask God to give you open eyes to see those in your life the way that he sees them as lost and in need of compassion and in need to hear the testimony that you that you have of Jesus' love. You can tell Jesus right now, God, I want to make my life about your mission. Give me your eyes. Maybe there's some things that have crept into your life where you'd say, you know what, God? I've been giving you second best for too long in too many areas of my life. And today, Jesus, I just want to come back. I don't want to give you my all. If that's you, you could say, I'm giving him my all. Right there in the comment section, let somebody know about the decision that Jesus is leading you to make. You can do it today. Let's pray. And then Brother Brian and Brother Waylon are going to lead us in another song. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you. And God, now. We just ask that you would move in this time of response. Father, anybody out there that is questioning whether they, whether you're speaking to them, God, we pray that you would make it evident that you are speaking to them right now to give their heart and their life to Jesus and that they would let somebody know that today's the day because of their faith in what Jesus did for them. God, move in the lives of your people. God, maybe many other prayer requests are uh, here today, and maybe we we just need you to we just need to know that you're moving through those. God, we lift them up to you. We're thankful that we can come to you. And Lord, now move and have your way as we sing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we had a closing song picked out, but uh, the Lord.
put another song on my heart, and we're going to end with People Need the Lord. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. Miss Brother Wayland, you want to give them a little info about the parking lot service at 6.30 tonight? Okay, uh, we'll be meeting again tonight, uh, 30 minutes later than last week. It's 6.30, and uh, we'll utilize the two front parking lots of the uh, church, and uh, we'll set up in that grassy area, the, the singers and the Brother Tony in the grassy area between the two lots, and so uh, this way the sun will be at your back, It'll be 30 minutes later, so it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, so uh, we'll have a couple of guys uh, directing traffic, and so if you'll follow them, their instructions, I think everything will go smoothly, and hope that you'll come and make plans to be with us tonight. All right. All right. Well, uh, again, we do hope that you, that you can make that here at 6.30 tonight and uh, make plans to come. Bring some friends. Invite some friends. We, uh, where we're at, we've, we're going to have plenty of space for them tonight. And we're talking about victory in Jesus tonight. And it's going to be a great time of worship together. If you uh, would like to send in uh, your tithe, your offering this week, uh, you can still continue to do that uh, here at the church uh, <clears throat> address. And uh, we'll be glad to receive that. And we just want to tell you, uh, as you send those in, thank you so much. Uh, we got to praise God here that uh, through all of this, uh, our church has been in a unique position uh, that not every church uh, can say, that. but we have not felt the, the crunch of the financial crisis here because of your generosity and Amen. God's blessing. And so we thank you so much for your, for your continued stewardship and faithfulness to God in that, in that regard. But until then, uh, we love you. Remember, God loves you. And uh, we will see you all at 6.30 tonight or uh, in the parking lot. Till then, bye-bye. <laughs>